2 Corinthians 9, Isaiah 7, Luke 2, and Romans 5. Now, obviously, this is a time of year when we're concerned about choosing just the right Christmas gifts to give to the special people in our lives. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever received an indescribable gift? I see some of you have. I mean, have you ever received a gift that is beyond description? And in what kind of gift would it have to be in order to be called indescribable? Would it be a gift that when you open it, you, you look at it and you say, Oh man, this is just beautiful. This is something I, that I've wanted all my life. Um, what is it? <laughs> you ever had one like that? Yeah. What is it? Or maybe your indescribable gift is a gift that carries a lot of emotional feelings with it. It may have been given to you by someone very special and was a complete surprise when it was given. And you would treasure that kind of gift always because of your emotionally filled memories. Would that make it an indescribable gift? Or maybe an indescribable gift would be a gift that we cared so little about that we wouldn't even bother to find the words to describe it. Uh, and a few of those along the way too. Years ago, on the, on the television program Good Morning America, Joan London, when she was on, this is a number of years back, she featured some gift ideas that might be called um, indescribable. They were extraordinary gifts. Some of us uh, might want to include on our Christmas gift list. One of them was a Jaguar automobile. At that time, the Jaguar 220. Care to order one of those babies? Go down to the Jaguar dealer, put down an $80,000 deposit. Then when the automobile is delivered, you're expected to pay a balance of $507,000. <laughs> At that time, the Jaguar 220 was a $587,000 automobile, and they only make 250 of them each year. Ms. London also mentioned that if you were to purchase such an automobile, you might be interested in a new car wax that promises to give the car the ultimate shine. The car wax retails for $3,400 for an eight ounce can. I guess if you could afford $587,000 for the automobile, you wouldn't have any problem spending $3,400 to wax the thing. Then she showcased, get this, I don't understand this, but some, some billionaire Saudi guy may want this thing. $300,000 gold and silver toilet seat <laughs> with inlaid with precious stones. I'm thinking, that might hurt unless they got something to work out, you know. I'm, I'm just thinking. And, and, then, and then she went to, she went to some of the cheap stuff for those who have everything. An $18,000 Frisbee, a $10,000 Yo-Yo, a $12,000 Mousetrap, and a $27,000 pair of sunglasses. And for the proud grandparent who is wondering what to buy the new grandbaby, how about a $28,000 Passive? Now, I wish I had one of those sometimes with some of these Baptists that get out of line. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> it's the injury that's making me act up. Uh, I mean, you look at all these gifts, and you can make long lists anywhere you want, and some of them are just, they stagger our imagination, but they are not indescribable. Every human gift is describable by someone else. But in 2 Corinthians 9, 
Paul, at first, he wrote about some human gifts. The church is, is taking up some offerings to help uh, the poor Christians in Jerusalem. They were going through a famine, and so he was talking about human gifts and gifts of financial support, things like that, in, the, in, in chapters 8 and chapter 9. And, and he commends the Corinthian church for their eagerness to help. And, and he, and he uh, reminds them about that. And, and those, he also says to them as they're considering this gift to Jerusalem, he says, now remember, if you give a little, you're going to reap a little. But if you give a lot, then you'll reap a lot. If you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you sow generously, you reap generously, using the metaphor of, of planting and, and uh, reaping the harvest. Then he shifts his attention <clears throat> from human gifts to God's gift of sending Jesus to earth for us. Right. And that's where he gets stumped. He just gets stumped. And he cannot <coughs> find the words to describe God's gift. So this is what he, he ends the chapter. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, and see what he says. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. This is the best thing you come up with. It's indescribable. It's like, I, I, I did not tell the choir to sing indescribable. I did not. The choir did not know I was going to bring this message. So I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is going to talk to us today. Amen. You are here, not by accident, because God wants you to hear what we're going to say today. I'm going to take a stab at, at possible reasons why the gift of Christ to us is unspeakable and indescribable. First thing I think is the gift of Christ to us is indescribable because of his dual nature. You say, well, what are you talking about? Well, I want you to turn back this part. I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. This is the prophet, the old Hebrew prophet, 700 years before the time that Jesus lived. The prophet Isaiah was on the earth and he wrote uh, these inspired words from in, in God's scripture. Isaiah 7 and verse number 14. The prophet wrote, Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign, a miraculous, never happened before, will never happen again event. God himself is going to do something so magnificently significant that it's called a sign. And this is what it is. Behold, the prophet said, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, now how, how can we speak correctly about Jesus? I mean, how do we describe Jesus? What, what words would we choose? How do we describe a, a baby born of a virgin? Now, I want to make sure everybody understands here. His mother, Mary, never had any kind of sexual relations with anyone, with anyone, and she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. That's the sign. That's the miracle. That's the never happened before, has never happened since, and will never happen again. So how do we speak about that? How do we tell a world that is, is totally lacking in faith and has no, uh, no concept of what the Bible is all about? How do you tell somebody that a, a young lady, uh, a virgin, just got pregnant with no man in this picture at all, nothing, no, no hocus pocus, no nothing. It's just what, and they'll say, what? It's, how do you speak of that? How do we describe God in the flesh, walking on earth, who at the same time is the sovereign creator of all of the earth? How do you put that in words? I mean, Isaiah said that he would be called the Emmanuel, 
Bible is a Hebrew word. And when it's translated into English, it means God with us. His name's going to be Emmanuel, meaning God came down in the form of human flesh to be with us. How do you describe that? How do you describe What words could we choose? How do we describe that which is spirit? God is spirit. And they that must, if they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So how do you describe that God as a spirit took upon himself human flesh? How do we describe that? How do we describe that which is spirit when all that we have ever known is that which is either physical or material? <laughs> How do you describe God who has all knowledge when all we have is limited knowledge? How do we describe God as all-powerful, as the song of the choir said? And how do we describe the eternal? How do you how do you how do you describe infinity? How do you describe eternal? How do we describe the indescribable? Well, Christian theologians and scholars, they got together and they tried to describe Jesus. Years ago, some of the greatest theological minds on the planet at the time, they came together and they tried, they tried to describe Jesus. And the meeting was called a council. And it was located in Chalcedon uh, over in Europe. Here's what they came up with to describe Jesus. Perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood. Truly man of a reasonable, rational soul and body. Consubstantial, co-essential with the Heavenly Father according to the manhood in all things like us, but without sin, begotten before all ages of the Heavenly Father, according to the Godhead, and in these latter times for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary and of the Mother of God, according to the manhood, one and the same, Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures. <clears throat> Inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, and the distinction of the two natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved. Now that's the thing. They took a long time to say he's the God man. That's what it is. He's God and man at the same time. They took a lot of they took a lot of words to say that. that that's one of the best attempts to speak of the God man Jesus. You see, even when we bring the greatest minds, our greatest minds, our most extensive vocabularies, and we bring it to bear, we cannot adequately describe the two natures of Jesus Christ. The dual nature. He's one of he's not 50 50, he's not 50 percent God. He's a hundred percent God and a hundred percent man at the same time. <laughs> it defies description. But it's unspeakable. It's indescribable. That's exactly why Paul says what he said in 2 Corinthians 9 15. Thanks be unto God. For his unspeakable gift. You just, you just stop with words to come up with to figure this out. You see, when it comes to God's gift of Jesus Christ to us at Christmas, and his whole life in ministry, death, burial, and resurrection, when it comes to that, the, it, it's just, we have difficulty describing his gift. And the gift of Christ to us is indescribable because of his dual nature. And the gift of Christ to us is indescribable because of his purpose in coming to earth. This is where I want you to look at Luke chapter 2. Look at 
look at Luke chapter 2, where the Bible describes that first Christmas morning. Luke chapter 2, we'll pick up at verse number 8. Look at Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. A Savior, that's the key word. A Savior, this world needed a Savior. Yes. And he was born that day, and they call him Christ the Lord, Christ the Messiah. You see, Jesus came to, as a Savior to seek and to save that which was lost. I mean, how do you go about describing the eternal plan for our salvation. How, where do you begin? Before the foundation of the world, God saw you and he saw me. And God saw that we needed to be saved from our sins mm -hmm. and from eternal punishment. God is perfectly holy and we are sinful. And there will no sin enter into heaven. But because he loved us, he provided a way in which he could take away our sin and give us his righteousness so that we could be in heaven with him forever. Say amen. 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 How do you describe that? He saw our inhumanity and, and, and depravity and our our. our just start fighting and warring and sinning and rebelling all this whole world. Let me just say this. There will never be world peace until the Prince of Peace returns. Amen. I mean, back in 1989, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, breakup of the old Soviet Union, many thought, finally, Finally, we can have world peace. <laughs> well, all the civil wars, regional skirmishes, military coups, terrorist attacks, insecurity, and unrest in the world have long since evaporated any real hopes of lasting world peace. No, the sinful nature of man has not. They can not wall or two is it going to change. When God looks at our world, he knows our greatest need is not for more wealth. It's not for better schools. It's not for healthier food. All those things are good in themselves. That's not what our greatest need is. Our greatest need is for a Savior. Amen. There will never be peace on earth until we have been lifted out of our sins, our hearts changed, and our way of thinking transformed and altered by the Holy Spirit of God. Say amen. Amen. See, our greatest need is to be saved by the only Savior of the world. Amen. Tell me his name. Jesus. Jesus. Everybody together, nice and loud. Jesus. Jesus. He is the only. Savior. Amen. Amen. How can we put that in the words? The Bible does it for us, thankfully. But when you go out trying to describe that, you go out there and you say, Jesus is the only way. So wait a minute, pal. He may be your way, but I've got my way. Okay? You, you swear, they just can't. They, you can't swear, no, 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 no. Well, I don't believe the Bible. They're not in the Bible. I don't believe the Bible. I got my own holy book right here. You got your holy book up here. How do you describe? How do you describe? How can you put into words what God accomplished when He sent to Bethlehem His only begotten Son? So when it comes to God's gift of Jesus Christ to us, we have difficulty. We have difficulty describing His gift. 
that, I mean, the, the gift of Christ to us is indescribable because of his dual nature. The gift of Christ to us is indescribable because of his purpose in coming to earth. And the gift of Christ to us is indescribable because of the grace by which Jesus was given. Amen. And every gift I give this Christmas is going to be a gift that I give because the recipient of that gift has some claim on me. You know, I, I'll give a gift to my wife because I want to sleep in my bed at night. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's, it's the injury that's making me act up. That's, that's what it is. No, I, honestly, I'll buy a gift for my wife because she's my wife. I'll buy gifts for my children because they're my children. I'll buy gifts for my friends because they're my friends. The bottom line is we buy gifts for others because we feel that somehow they have a claim on us. Now, if I buy a gift for you and you are not in my family or circle of friends, it's probably because you bought a gift for me last year and I didn't have one for you, so I feel like I owe you one. Again, I feel like there's a claim. And even if I give a gift to feed the hungry or clothe the naked or take care of some homeless, I do it because deep down inside, I, I recognize that I have a debt to humanity. I, I, I feel an obligation. There's, some, I have, I have some, there's a feeling of a claim on me. Well, that's what makes God's gift of Jesus Christ so unspeakable. God does not owe us the time of day. That's right. We have no claim on him. We have no merit to ask him to be our savior or to save us and do anything for him. God would be just in his holiness to just burn the place up and be done with everything. Yeah. He, ha he is not the truth is, we're in constant rebellion against his word and his will for our lives. That's why Romans 5, verse 8, is so incredible. Look back at Romans chapter 5, that's where I want to see this cross reference. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. The Bible says, But God commends his love toward us. He gave us his love, still gives us his love, in that even while we are yet sinning, while we're going our own way, while we're turning our backs on everything spiritual and good and faithful, while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Amen. Thank God for it. Thank God for Jesus. God gave Jesus not because he feels obligated to give a gift, but because his love for us is so overwhelming to him. The giving of Christ is an indescribable gift of grace. There's no other word for God's grace than amazing. That's why we sing amazing grace. And even that word falls way short of describing the fullness of his love. Or does. So when it comes to God's gift of Jesus Christ to us, we have difficulty, difficulty describing his gift. Because of his dual nature, because of the purpose in coming to earth, and because of the grace by which Jesus is given. But I want you to turn back a couple of pages from 2 Corinthians 9. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, if you would, please. 2 Corinthians 5. The gift of Christ to us is indescribable because of what happens to us when we accept him. Would you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17 where the Bible says therefore if any man be in Christ that means you've accepted him as your savior, you've believed in him as dying on the cross for your sins 
and raise him from the dead. That means you're in Christ. You've accepted that, believe it, and say the only, I, the only way I can go to heaven is if I believe it. That's where you're at. And then you're in Christ. That's what he means by that. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And the old ways of life, and the old ways of thinking, and the old thing, the old way of doing things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. Say amen. amen. I mean, there's never there has never been a gift given to me that has changed my life like receiving Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? There's, there's never been a gift from one person to another that has changed the receiver like the gift of Jesus. Amen. I mean, just think about it. When, when we open our gifts this Christmas, are we going to be spiritually transformed by what we open? <coughs> or are we going to be changed from the inside out when we receive the gifts that have been purchased for us by our loved ones? Will, will those gifts change our life and, and just make us go in a whole new, positive, good, and faithful direction? Or will we be the same old, same old that we've always been, just with more stuff? Yes. But when we accept Jesus, when we put our faith and trust in him, the indescribable <laughs> gift of God we're never the same again, say amen. Amen. He changes us on the inside out. I mean, it, he affects our life by his indescribable gift. Just think about it. We are forever forgiven of our sins. By his indescribable gift, we are adopted into God's family. I'm a child of God, say amen. By his indescribable gift, we receive the Holy Spirit into our lives. He lives in us. He guides us and counsels us and empowers us and protects us. By his indescribable gift, we have a peace in our heart and soul that passes human understanding. By his indescribable gift, I have a mansion over there for all eternity. Say amen. Amen. That's what you call incredible. That's what you call indescribable. That's what you call unspeakable. Amen. I'm doing the best I can. But I think even more than others, I'm, a, I'm afraid I've fallen a bit short in trying to speak of the unspeakable gift that is Christ Jesus. So I'm just going to fall back on Paul's words and I'm going to ask you just to repeat it with me. Look at 2 Corinthians 9, 15 again. That little short verse when he was stumped and all he could say. Let's all say it together. Can you guys put the verse up there again? 2 Corinthians 9, 15. Let's say it all together. <coughs> Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Again. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. And all God's people say. Amen. Amen. 